Hello, 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 and welcome to Sexual Health Literacy with me, Christy Abel. It is my distinct honor to share the following information with you on behalf of Rethink Sex Education. Let's get started. But before we begin, I would like to recognize and appreciate that I am an invited guest in the traditional territory of the Sawathan and Musqueam First Nations. I have the privilege to work, learn, play, and live in this beautiful place, and I am committed to being a steward of this land. I express gratitude to the Coast Salish community and all Homohoyan speaking people and offer my respect to all of the elders who have gone before us and First Nations people with us today. I encourage you to do the same wherever in the world you may be. Haichika. Okay, so here's our agenda for the next like 40 minutes or so. First of all, I'll talk about who I am, <laughs> who am I, what's my mission, what do we have to offer at Rethink Sex Education, I'll go over sexual health literacy and human rights, as well as cover some points about the importance of sexual health literacy for young people, and then we'll expand across the lifespan, I'll talk a little bit about values and ethics, and then uh, my consent uh, for you to share, or perhaps not. So me, I'm Christy Abel, and I am a certified sexual health educator through the University of Alberta. It's a graduate program through their rehabilitation medicine, and it is an incredible program. And uh, I would encourage anyone with a bachelor's degree, if they're interested in sexual health, to pursue this grad level program. All right. I also have a master's degree in counseling psychology from the University of Victoria, and I have been a practicing counselor in schools since 2010. I also have a bachelor of education. I was a teacher for eight years before pursuing, uh, before pursuing counseling, and that was through UBC. And it all started way back in 1994 when I started my bachelor of English literature at UBC. So I have, at this point of this recording, I have over 23 years experience working with youth in schools. I've also had my own private practice. I'm the mom of two kids with my wonderful partner, Ben. Uh, I'm now a YouTuber, <laughs> baseball coach, volleyball coach. I love being outside and I love educating. Um, I am, I love being coached and I love coaching. This is one of my passions in life for sure. And I live and work in beautiful British Columbia in Canada. Okay, the mission Rethink Sex Ed was formed in 2021 to help to demystify the ever-changing sexual health dynamics of just being a human these days. Things be changing real fast all the time, and it can seem very overwhelming to try to keep off, especially when it comes to sexual health. So that being said, I'm also an active participant in social justice and have been since I was a child. <laughs> My primary goal here with this channel is to teach people from kindergarten to the care home how to make empowered sexual health decisions. So then you can be an advocate, not just for yourself, but also for others. Our sexual relationships, I mean, we are a sexual being from the moment we're born, we come out of our birth mother and you are declared to be, it's a boy or it's a girl. Now we know now that sometimes that doesn't stick. But what that does is it automatically sexualizes us right out of the proverbial gate. All right. So um, it's very important that we understand that, that our sexuality is ours, right? And also, but also it's something that is also um, interpersonal. Okay. Um, now through comprehensive sexual health education, which I believe leads to sexual health literacy, we can help create a culture of consent and also at the same time reduce gender-based violence. These two things are tenets of Rethink Sex Ed um, and creating the overarching theme of this whole channel will be create, to help create consent culture. And uh, everything that I will be showing is human rights based and research based. I'm a research person. If it can't be backed up with research, I will not say it. So 
woo, this is um, rather refreshing in the world of sexual health, which tends to be rife with opinions masquerading as facts. So uh, I will just flat out not be doing that. Okay, so now as I, with the material that I've found, um, I have explicitly looked for things that are LGBTQ2S plus and differing ability inclusive. It's not possible all the time, but I have definitely, sex ed is for everybody. It doesn't matter what race you are, how old you are, uh, what your gender is, what your sexual orientation is, right? I could go on and on and on um, about how we're all so different, but sex ed is for everybody. And that is a key component of what um, I'm creating with this channel. Now, as we go through the lifespan, of course, some things are going to be appropriate for the littles and some are not, right? So I'll give guidelines as to the appropriate ages based on research, right? And my experience. Um, but at the end of the day, it's up to you if you are an adult watching this in the hopes of finding some help for sexual health with your kids, right? As the caregiver, you get the one, you're the one who decides, I want to empower you to be the one who says, no, my kid's not ready for this, or yes, or oh my gosh, I should have seen this, you know, like <laughs> last year or the year before or whatever. But ultimately, my goal is to empower you and to help you be that primary source for your kids by hopefully removing some of the awkwardness around this topic, which of course it is, <laughs> there's lots around it. If there's not for you, awesome, that's really, really great. But for the most part, um, sexual health is a topic that makes a lot of people <sighs> kind of cringe a little bit. So what do I have to offer, right? So I have spent literally hundreds of hours scouring web resources to find the most up-to-date, the most inclusive, the most fact-based, and the most comprehensive information available. Now, I'm a sexual health educator with a master's degree in counseling, okay? And I found it to be exhausting, a little intimidating and frustrating. So I can't even imagine what it would be like as a parent or just your own advocating for your own self, your family, how it's just, there's just so much. So I have used my lens and filter as a parent as a certified sex educator, as a counselor, as a teacher, okay, as a person who is a sexual being, I have sifted and I have sorted and I have through masses amounts of information. And then I've organized them into these very digestible chunks, right? Teacher, girl knows how to put a lesson together, okay? And often entertaining, right? When we're laughing, when we feel more comfortable, we learn better, okay? People do learn when they're having better, when they're having fun. And so I'm hopefully have um, picked some things that will also be, you know, not boring, okay? <laughs> That's the point. I don't want these things to be boring. And sometimes when we cover things like STIs, right? That's a lot of science. That's a lot of biology, but I do hopefully find ways to make it interesting. All right. And uh, one of my, another primary goal that I have is to help reduce the stigma, right? Which is the fear of being judged around sexual health. So when people, when we reduce stigma, people will then go access the healthcare that they have a right to have, but stigma might be holding them back to going and having those conversations with a healthcare provider. Okay, so here we have SICAN, which is the Sex Information and Education Council of Canada. And I love the way that they have, they have written this. So sexual health is a key component of overall health, well-being, and quality of life. Is a determining factor in the well being of individuals, partners, families, and communities. Furthermore, the sexual health of people in Canada has important and social, social and economic implications for the country. Therefore, the development and implementation of comprehensive sexual health education aimed at enhancing sexual health and well being, as well as preventing outcomes that negatively impact sexual health, should be a public policy priority. Now, in the past, most sex ed, even if it's comprehensive, has been around, has been structured around preventing negative outcomes like don't get an STI and don't get pregnant and don't get sexually assaulted. And yes, these things are important, but sexuality is so much more than that. It is so much greater. And it's right. It is just as important uh, to our overall umbrella of health as physical health or and or mental health, right? So we just want, I want it on the same playing field on the platform with these things because it is a major component of our overall health and well-being. 
Okay, when it comes to human rights, uh, Sex I Can also states that sexual health education should educate people about their human rights in relation to sexual and reproductive health. Again, big focus for Rethink. Uh, the content and guiding philosophy of sexual health education programs should be aligned with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which outlines all Canadians' rights to personal liberty and freedom of thought, belief, and opinion. Sexual health education should encourage and facilitate a person's right to make informed, autonomous decisions. Yes, 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 <laughs> to promote human rights. Human uh, sexual health education should also strongly emphasize that individuals have an equal obligation to respect the rights of others. This is consent at its core. And again, the major overarching theme of Rethink Sex Ed. Okay. The United States has one of the highest teenage birth rates amongst other industrialized nations. And some have blamed the US's more conservative methods of sexual education. So we wanted to know why is the US so far behind? Well, according to the most recent World Bank data, which measures teen births from girls aged 15 to 19, Europe has most of the world's lowest teen birth rates. Frontrunner countries like Italy, Germany, and Switzerland reported rates below 14 births per thousand people. Sweden, France, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Belgium also had low rates, just five or 16 births per thousand people. Overall, European countries tend to have less than 20 teen births per thousand. Why? Well, Europe's low teen birth rate has been partially attributed to progressive sexual education. One researcher found that in the Netherlands, parents and teachers focus less on the dangers of sex and more on the normal positive aspects. Dutch teenagers are therefore less likely to be secretive and misinformed about their first sexual experiences. Other Northern European countries in particular hold that young people are still rights holders and are entitled to correct and comprehensive sex education. The U.S., by contrast, has one of the highest teenage birth rates of all developed nations, around 30 teen births per thousand. Many believe that this high rate has to do with their more repressive views toward teen sex. In southern states especially, they teach abstinence-only sexual education, which leaves out key details about pregnancy and diseases. United Nations reports have noted that this kind of education can backfire and contribute to more risky sexual behavior. The U.S. also has a generally more negative attitude toward sex, highlighting the dangers and the risks associated with it instead of the benefits of a healthy, intimate relationship. So does sex ed make a difference? Well, there certainly seems to be a positive correlation between comprehensive sex ed and low teen birth rates. However, not all countries follow this pattern and many scholars still disagree on the best methods to decrease teen births. Some United Nations officials maintain that although the rates of teen sex are unlikely to change, the safety of teen sex can be significantly improved with sexual education. There we go. All right. Um, now, uh, some of the uh, you'll see that that was um, particularly about the United States, and I'm not by any means like picking on the United States, but we do need to. I will be talking about abstinence only programs when I talk about when I do the contraception. Okay, so there's a contraception literacy that will be coming out next week. So by the time you're watching this, it'll already be out. All right. So we need to conclude everybody. And I will talk about the research again. And um, actually, one thing that's very interesting is absence only until marriage education, um, sex education leaves a lot of people out, particularly those in the LGBTQ2S plus uh, community. The United I don't know why that's not working. It's weird. Now, but Speaking of the United States, now I would like to say most of the, uh, you could be watching this anywhere in the world, and I totally respect that. Um, my research primarily will be coming from Canada and the United States, and but we will find that a lot of these things, it, depending on the culture, of course, of where you are and your personal beliefs, those kinds of things, um, that, uh, so I am going to be uh, slightly biased in the research in this way, but that's just where my education has been. So I would encourage you to take a look at the standards of practice in the country that you are in, um, because of course those are going to vary. Okay, now the United States, okay, there is an, a nonprofit organization called PSYCHIS, the Sexuality Information 
and uh, Education Council of the United States. And they are doing their best and they're doing a fantastic job of moving towards comprehensive sex education um, and and then focusing on the research, okay? So their focus here is, I must say, it is, um, uh, I don't wanna say it's lofty, but it's because I, I fully believe in culture shift and change. And uh, this is just, I just think this is very, this is very ideal. So our focus is on advancing comprehensive sex education as a means of building a foundation for long-term culture shift that will positively impact all levels of society, particularly issues of sexuality, sexual and reproductive health, gender equity, consent, personal safety, and autonomy. Psychus commits to working to dismantle the systems of power and oppression, which perpetuate disparate, disparate uh, sexual and reproductive health outcomes and incubate stigma and shame around sex and sexuality across the intersections of age, race, size, gender, gender identity and expression, class, sexual orientation and uh, ability. If we can use sexual health education as a platform um, and as a foundation to start well, there's a lot of cultural change shifting already happening in these areas, but I love how Psychus ties it in to uh, comprehensive sex education. I just think that's really incredible. Okay, and the WHO, the World Health Organization, of which we'll see a short video after this, um, when that video actually is the anchor point for this whole um, uh, presentation. Um, so what does, how does WHO define sexual health? It is a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. It is not just the absence of disease, dysfunction, or infirmity. Just like health doesn't mean, just because you don't have a terminal illness doesn't mean that, um, anyways, the, the health, health, our health is not determined by just the things that are not wrong with us, right? Okay, so it involves a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. The sexual rights of all persons must be respected, protected, and fulfilled. So this was recently, well, kind of revised recently in 2015, but um, it's a significant change from the 90s version that was written, okay? Um, now, there are many places in the world where sexual experiences are not free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. And my hope with this channel, what with it being accessible to the world, is that, again, we're always going to keep coming back to empowerment, empowerment, empowerment. All right. I'd like to make five points about sexuality education. First is sexuality education is often um, seen as um, telling young people to uh, put on condoms when they are not really ready to have sex. Sexuality education includes three things. One is it improves knowledge and understanding. Second is it is intended to build um, equitable norms uh, and values and to promote self-reflection um, and uh, among adolescents. And thirdly, it aims to build social skills to refuse unwanted sex or to negotiate safe sex when needed. So it, it's a whole lot of things. And it really is not just about sex and reproduction. It really aims to prepare young people for a healthy sexual and reproductive life and a pleasurable sexual and reproductive life and to prevent problems if and when uh, and to uh, obtain care if and when these problems occur. Um, the second point I'd like to make is uh, there's convincing evidence from around the world that well-designed and well-delivered sexuality education programs result in good and do not cause harm. Uh, well-designed, uh, well-delivered sexuality education programs can improve knowledge and understanding, promote um, uh, healthy behaviors, uh, and um, when combined with a healthy dose of uh, gender and discussion of gender and power has been actually, it has actually been shown to reduce health problems, um, unwanted pregnancies, sexually transmitted infections, HIV. The third point I'd like to make is that children and adolescents need sexuality education. 
they need sexuality education because they often don't know about their bodies they don't know um, about puberty they don't know about um, um, how to protect themselves and um, to avoid uh, sexual and reproductive health problems for instance many many um, adolescents in many parts of the world do not use contraception because they are really scared of its side effects um, and if they have problems they don't know where to go for help they have, children and adolescents need sexuality education and they have a right to sexuality education and this is enshrined in the convention of the rights of the child knowledge um, information and education for survival and for well-being the fourth point and the sad point is that we're failing our children and adolescents we're failing them at home we're failing them at school and we're failing them in our communities even today in many parts of the world high middle and low income countries it's easier for a girl or a boy to access pornography with a quick a few quick clicks of their mouse uh, rather than to um, be able to talk uh, to an adult who cares for them, who's responsible for them, a parent, um, an elder sibling, uh, an uncle, an aunt, a teacher, a health worker, um, about uh, their bodies, about sex, about reproduction. Um, and this stems from a deep-seated um, lack of willingness to accept that adolescents are sexual beings. Um, and um, Springing from that is this either denial of adolescent sexuality, refusing to accept adolescent sexuality, and when uh, there is uh, evidence that it's occurring to wish it away. And so sexuality education is often seen, if it is seen as useful at all, it is seen as um, useful in telling young people not to have sex. I'm 60, and, you know, the sexuality education I had when I was a student of 13 in uh, growing up in Bombay in India was on the sidelines of the school playground. I heard about it from a peer. Um, and sadly, that's true still in so many parts of the world. The big difference is when I was growing up, we didn't have the internet and we didn't have uh, pornography being thrust at you from various sources. That's what we have to deal with today. It's not information that's corrupting young people. It's misinformation, which is confusing young people, leaving them um, really worried about what's happening in their world. To end on a positive note, the, uh, uh, earlier this year, UNESCO uh, led a group of uh, UN agencies, including WHO, to publish an updated international technical guidance on sexuality education updated from the 2009 version. This is a powerful document, a powerful document in that it provides evidence of the need for sexuality education, the effectiveness of sexuality education, and provides um, guidance on how it can be designed and applied, even in the most conservative contexts. And it contains a whole section on points to make and um, arguments to use in addressing the concerns, questions, misinformation that decision makers, families, communities in many places have. And the very last point to make is that a growing, a small but growing number of countries are actually biting the um, uh, the bullet, if you like. They're taking, um, they recognize that they need to provide sexuality education and they're getting going with it. In the past, these was Northern European countries. Now you have countries around the world, countries such as Zambia, countries such as Colombia, countries such as um, Thailand. These are countries who are beginning to recognize that that we uh, we cannot um, you know, put our heads, hide our heads in the sand anymore. And that in this crossroads, we really have to um, uh, acknowledge and that adolescents need sexuality education and that we have to get going to deliver it to them. Thank you. Thank you. I love everything that he I said. <laughs> All right, let's talk about porn. <laughs> All right. So why, why? So one of the reasons why we, um, you know, as parents, as caregivers and guardians, it's so essential that we be the first step in um, talking about sex, because when kids start to have questions, this is where they are turning. And it is 
not sexual health education, okay? So sexually internet, explicit internet movies, otherwise known as porn. Now let's be clear, porn's been around for a real long time, thousands of years, but it has never been so prolific and so have so much influence on um, pop culture and on particular and youth culture as well. All right, so here we have some studies, right? So commonsense.org, which is a wonderful, um, a very, very reliable resource for uh, mental health, sexual health, for a whole bunch of different um, topics. Um, remember, I'm also a mental health clinician. Uh, so I've used their stuff with mental health as well. So uh, in a very recent study, uh, the average age reported for the first viewing of pornography is age 12. That is average. Uh, an Australian, um, uh, the Australian Institute of Family Studies. Uh, now this is a bit old, so we can actually probably assume that it's more now, but 75% of 16 year olds have been accidentally exposed to pornographic websites. And this comes from mistyping a word in a search engine. It comes from um, Twitter links. It comes from, it, it can pop up on a lot of different places. Now, 38% of boys by the time they're 16 and 2% of girls had deliberately accessed, which is a different story. However, it can be very shocking to a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old to all of a sudden click and have that in your face. It can be very confusing and it's very misleading. So I do have a, a pornography lit literacy lesson. I will put the link below um, so that you can check that out and vet it to see if it is for something to share with your 12 plus year old child. Um, it's also for adults. Um, anyways, I'll go over that more in that presentation. All right. Now, this is um, the British Film Board, uh, sorry, Board of Film Classification found that 48% of teens who consume porn did so to learn about sex. So one of the most important things that we need to, to share with young people is that, that this is fiction. It is not real life and we should not assume that it is real life. So despite the fact that it can be wildly unrealistic and often glorifies violence, sexism and or racism, more a recent survey found that more than half of boys and over a third of girls believe that it is realistic that this is what sex should look like and this is incredibly problematic um, especially in concerns to uh, consent in terms of sexual assault sexual harassment right so when we have sexual health literacy um, via comprehensive sexual health education it can help us bust those myths um, that about in sexually explicit internet movies in regards to sexual taste, gender-based violence, and sexual assault. And again, another missions of Rethink Sex Ed is, and this channel, is to help reduce sexual assault. Okay, 66% of people, uh, survivors of sexual violence, it happened between the ages of 12 and 17, okay, 16 percent, with the majority overwhelmingly, the majority being female. If a young a person born male is not sexually assaulted by the age he is 16 or they are 16, um, they have almost a negligible, like almost zero chance of being sexually assaulted for the rest of their lives, whereas a third of women constantly, and that number skyrockets if they are a person of color or uh, are in the LGBTQ2S plus umbrella or have uh, any type of physical or um, developmental disability. Okay, so uh, I will share those statistics um, in the uh, uh, sexual consent literacy program that should roll out in a few weeks. Okay, so sexual violence is at an all-time high for adolescents, so we want to encourage you, I want to empower you to have those conversations with kids about prevention, boundaries, consent, body autonomy, and safety. This comes from amaze.org. Uh, you will notice that in many, I use many of the amaze videos in my lessons. It's because they're fantastic. And the kids that have um, tested this and approved a lot of the, the uh, material that I'm presenting, they have also said yes to amaze. So if there's something that you have a question about, uh, particularly involving youth, um, and I have not done anything about it yet, um, go to Amaze and see what is there. I definitely, I'm not affiliated, affiliated 
officially at this point. Um, but I just, I will always promote things that I feel are excellent, good quality um, resources. Okay, so we know that if we're going to create a culture of consent, kids need to learn about it. They need to know what it is and they need to feel empowered. So SEIM has made it so that we can't put our heads in the sand, like as Dr. Venkatraman from the WHO so eloquently states. So I'm here to ally with you, to help you and your family navigate these complexities of being a young person today. But then I'm also here for you, okay? As you navigate your own sexual health, regardless of whether or not you're raising children, regardless of where you are in the, your lifespan, there are ongoing, right? Um, wonders and challenges as we age, as it comes to sex, when it comes to sexual health. All right, and then across the lifespan, of course, it is sexual health ed is sex ed is not just for young people. Okay, we tend to kind of funnel it that way. But the last course that I took in my certification program was honestly, unexpectedly my favorite. And it was all about disability, sexual health and disability and illness. And one of the primary things that I learned in that in that class was that we're all really just temporarily able. I mean, I'm Christy Abel. I'm always able, but we are, we get hurt, right? I uh, fractured my tibia on New Year's Eve and it took, you know, three, four months to, to heal. And during that time, my sexual health behavior changed. It sure did. Right now that was also just a temporary thing, but sometimes there's these, there's these different stages and phases, um, different situations that will bring forth new facets of sexuality. So on this channel, I will be producing, yes, the things for youth. Okay. Very comprehensive. We'll do relationships. I'll do friendships. I'll do autonomy. I'll do different types of families. I'll do safety. I'll do internet safety. I'll do all these kinds of things for youth, right? That will also then apply. It's so funny. I have this one. It's going to be called friendship literacy. And I was showing it to a class in the school district and one of the EAs, and it's all about, you know, resolving conflict. And it's about like how to be a good friend and why do friendships end and all these kinds of things, right? And this, she must've been maybe 22, this education assistant, and she's watching it. And she says to me afterwards, she goes, my friends need this. And I said, okay. So it's not just for kids, even though it's geared towards kids. However, I will. Now, this list is definitely not exhaustive. It's just some of the initial ideas of where I will start. So sexual health and autism. Actually, my final project for that illness and disability class was on sexual health and autism. And I crushed it. So I just really have to tweak it a little bit to put it out there. Um, and it is uh, autistic people approved. I had three different people look at it and they all went, nailed it. So that was good. Okay. I'll do something on menopause and andropause. I'll do sexual health and chronic illness, right? So sexual health and Parkinson's sexual health and, uh, MS sexual health and cancer, right? I'll do how certain medications affect particularly like I, one comes to mind SSRIs and your sexual health, sexual health and mental health. Okay. So you can see like, as these roll out, I plan on having a new video every week. So if you are an, in alignment, you want to hit that notification bell. Uh, but we'll talk about subscribing in a sec here. Okay, let's talk about values and ethics. All right. So I believe that there's no space for morality teaching in sexual health literacy and comprehensive sexual health education. Okay, morals, values and ethics, they are taught within the family that is up to you. So I will not be judging anything here. Okay. There will be no judgment from me. Right. But if something I say or show doesn't align with your values, just don't show it to your kids and don't watch it. Right. So I feel like this is pretty straightforward, but I want to be very, very clear about this. I am an authority in this area, but I'm not the only authority in this area. I fully believe that comprehensive sex ed should be taught in schools, right? And some schools do a great job. Some schools don't do a great job. Some districts do a great job. Some don't, right? In terms of it being comprehensive, right? So there's all, and we are all teachers and learners, right? So I have deliberately made all of the videos not for kids, right? So when you upload a video on YouTube on the first page, it says, yes, it's made for children. No, it's made, not made for children. Even the ones for the littles, okay, I am going to make not for children. So as long as your safe search, which 
you can in the pornography literacy one I do talk about how you can start to um, if you're not already how you can help use things like safe search and whatnot so that to reduce the the um, chances of your kid being exposed to something wildly inappropriate for their age right um, so I'm making them not for children so your kids should not find me without your consent okay so that's really really important so the idea is in each one I'll do like a maybe like probably like five to 10 minute intro um, about like, here's the research, here's why we should be teaching this at this age, all that kind of stuff, right? And then you watch it, vet it, and then decide if you want to share it with your family, okay? So that is the idea. And if it's not in alignment, I'm sure you can find something else. I will also, or sometimes you might not like how I present it, like what I say, but you're like, Ooh, that's a good video. Okay. So I'll always link the videos below. You'll see that even in this one, in the description box, there will be hyperlinks to the videos that I use so that you can customize something for yourself. If you don't just don't like the way that I handled it. Okay. So if you like it, great, show it. If you don't great, don't. All right. Now, because I believe that the front line of sex ed should come from the home, I do not consent for any of Rethink's videos to be shown in schools nor organizations without my explicit written consent. Okay. So if your kid sees my stuff in school, that is not on me. I did not consent to that and it shouldn't be happening. Okay. So um, that being said, I do a very small amount of consulting work with schools and school districts in Canada. So if you're interested, you can just send me an email. My email is also on the, on the channel. Now, if you find what I have to share is valuable to you and your families, okay, please, or to someone you know who I'm covering a topic that you know that it might help them, please, please, please like, subscribe, and share so that we can, first of all, it does help grow the channel, right? And, but we cannot create a culture of consent without us sharing, without us breaking down the stigma. And again, this is what I want. This is my full intention uh, and beliefs around that. Okay. So woo, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to consider what I have to offer. Uh, if you've made it this far, thank you. And uh, let's wrap it up. Originally, I put this video with the consent one. Okay. But it's actually a broader metaphor that I think can apply more to comprehensive sex ed um, and a different way at looking at, um, at sexual health education. All right. Enjoy. I'd like to talk to you today about a whole new way to think about sexual activity and sexuality education by comparison. If you talk to someone today in America about sexual activity, you'll find pretty soon you're not just talking about sexual activity, you're also talking about baseball. Because baseball is the dominant cultural metaphor that Americans use to think about and talk about sexual activity. And we know that because there's all this language in English that seems to be talking about baseball, but that's really talking about sexual activity. So for example, you can be a pitcher or a catcher and that corresponds to whether you perform a sexual act or receive a sexual act. Of course, there are the bases which refer to specific sexual activities that happen in a very specific order ultimately resulting in a scoring a run or hitting a home run, which is usually having vaginal intercourse to the point of orgasm, at least for the guy. You can strike out, which means you don't get to have any sexual activity. And if you're a bench warmer, you might be a virgin or somebody for whom whatever reason isn't in the game, maybe because of your age or because of your ability or because of your skill set. A bat's a penis and a nappy dugout is a vulva or a vagina. A glove or a catcher's mitt is a condom. A switch hitter is a bisexual person, and we gay and lesbian folks play for the other team. And then there's this one. If there's grass on the field, play ball. 
And that usually refers to if a young person, specifically often a young woman, is old enough to have pubic hair, she's old enough to have sex with. This baseball model is incredibly problematic. It's sexist, it's heterosexist, it's competitive, it's goal-directed, and it can't result in healthy sexuality developing in young people or in adults. So we need a new model. I'm here today to offer you that new model, and it's based on pizza. Now, pizza is something that is universally understood and that most people associate with a positive experience. So let's do this. Let's take baseball and pizza and compare it when talking about three aspects of sexual activity. The trigger for sexual activity, what happens during sexual activity, and the expected outcome of sexual activity. So when do you play baseball? You play baseball when it's baseball season and when there's a game on the schedule. It's not exactly your choice. So if it's prom night or a wedding night or at a party or if our parents aren't home, hey, it's just batter up. Can you imagine saying to your coach, uh, not really feeling it today. I think I'll sit this game out. That's just not the way it happens. And when you get together to play baseball, immediately you're with two opposing teams. One playing offense, one playing defense. Somebody's trying to move deeper into the field. That's usually assigned to the boy. Somebody's trying to defend people moving into the field. That's often given to the girl. It's competitive. We're not playing with each other. We're playing against each other. And when you show up to play baseball, nobody needs to talk about what we're going to do or how this baseball game might be good for us. Everybody knows the rules. You just take your position and play the game. But when do you have pizza? Well, you have pizza when you're hungry for pizza. It starts with an internal sense, an internal desire or a need. Huh? I could go for some pizza. And because it's an internal desire, we actually have some sense of control over that. I can decide that I'm hungry, but know that it's not a great time to eat. And then when we get together with someone for pizza, we're not competing with them. We're looking for an experience that both of us will share that, that's satisfying for both of us. And when you get together for pizza with somebody, what's the first thing you do? You talk about it. You talk about what you want. You talk about what you like. You may even negotiate. How do you feel about pepperoni? Not so much. I'm kind of a mushroom guy myself. Well, maybe we can go half and half. And even if you've had pizza with somebody for a very long time, don't you still say things like, should we get the usual? <laughs> or maybe something a little more adventurous. Okay, so when you're playing baseball, so if you talk about during sexual activity, when you're playing baseball, you're just supposed to round the bases in the proper order one at a time. You can't hit the ball and run to right field. That doesn't work. And you also can't get to second base and say, I like it here. I'm going to stay here. No. And also, of course, with baseball, there's like the specific equipment and a specific skill set. Not everybody can play baseball. It's pretty exclusive. Okay, but what about pizza? When we're trying to figure out what's good for pizza, isn't it all about what's our pleasure? There are a million different kinds of pizza. There's a million different toppings. There's a million different ways to eat pizza. And none of them are wrong. They're different. And in this case, difference is good because that's going to increase the chance that we're having a satisfying experience. And lastly, what's the expected outcome of baseball? Well, in baseball, you play to win. You score as many runs as you can. There's always a winner in baseball, and that means there's always a loser in baseball. But what about pizza? Well, in pizza, we're not really, there's no winning. How do you win pizza? You don't. But you do look for, are we satisfied? And sometimes that can be different amounts over different times or with different people or in different days. And we get to decide when we feel satisfied. If we're still hungry, we might have some more. If you eat too much, though, you just feel gross. <laughs> so what if we could take this pizza model and overlay it on top of sexuality education? A lot of sexuality education that happens today is so influenced by the baseball model, and it sets up education that can't help but produce unhealthy sexuality in young people. 
and those young people become older people. But if we could create sexuality education that was more like pizza, we could create education that invites people to think about their own desires, to make deliberate decisions about what they want, to talk about it with their partners, and to ultimately look for not some external outcome, but for what feels satisfying. And we get to decide that. You may have noticed in the baseball and pizza uh, comparison, under the baseball, it's all commands. They're all exclamation points. But under the pizza model, they're questions. And who gets to answer those questions? You do, I do. So remember, when we're thinking about sexuality education and sexual activity, baseball, you're out. Pizza is the way to think about healthy, satisfying sexual activity and good comprehensive sexuality education. Thank you very much for your time. All right, to wrap this up, uh, le fin, it's the end. Um, you know, I love this one because I love baseball. I'm a baseball coach, um, but that he really nails it, um, this uh, TED Talk guy. And again, pizza can be found all over the world. All right. I hope you decide to check out the rest of my channel. I hope this has been valuable for you. And uh, I didn't mean to do that. So here we go.